I love this story. Louis de Bois. Although, <laughs> since I'm not an expert in French, A, and B, that de Bois, I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. I'm gonna call him Louis de Broglie. To be as Americanized as I can and as brutal to the French language as possible. In 1923, this guy was a graduate student. And it's the triumph of the little guy here, right? And it's also sort of everything that you thought you knew being flipped on its head. He says, oh, and it's also from fundamental symmetry arguments. He says, I like girls who have one eye over here and another eye over here and a single nose and I'm also a big fan of hair that's parted in the middle and I also notice that we've got light that kind of acts like a particle sometimes, right? So let's jot that down. Light acts as a particle, yo. And he says, <laughs> Light's clearly a wave, right? Acting as a particle. He says, maybe, maybe particles wave. Does that mean like stuff wiggles? What the heck? What is he talking about? Does he mean that things have a wavelength? Yeah, he actually does. So he wants you to take this equation here where we were talking about momentum of light and momentum of light was H divided by the wavelength of the light and that was troubling enough. But he wants to say that this equation right here applies to the wavelength of things like your car and electrons and France, you know, dang it. All right, so he's saying that the wavelength of France is H, some stupid number, some fantastically small number, divided by the momentum of France. And you think the momentum of France is a big number or a small number? So we got a small number here divided by, what do you think? Big number or small number? The momentum of France, probably a pretty big number if you consider the velocity of France as seen by, I don't know, the moon or something. The momentum of France is freaking enormous. So France's wavelength is very small. But let's consider Anton. Anton is a typical built guy. He's something like 77 kilograms. And if he's going at, uh, let's see, he's going three meters per second. He is barreling at you at three meters per second. Anton's momentum then is, let's do a little bit of math here. Oh, see if it turns off. Does it turn off right here? What? Okay, cool. So let's do his momentum, which will be uh, P is M times V, just a little momentum, 77 times three. We've got 231 kilogrammeters per second. And what I'm about to do is find Anton's wavelength. Anton's wavelength, therefore, must be H divided by P. And I'm gonna plug in 6.6 three times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds and divide that by Anton's momentum, which is 231 kilogrammeters per second. Wow, look at all these times that are going to be canceling out and multiplying and stuff. It turns out, I mean, we could go through the unit. Yeah, let's just, let's go through the units. One joule is, let's see, joule is work, which is force times distance, so it's, um, kilogram meters per second squared, kil kilogram meters per second squared times distance, which is gonna be another meter right there. So that's a joule, so we've got this stuff times a second, that cancels out right there, and then I'm supposed to divide this right here, this is joule seconds divided by kilogram meters per second. I'm supposed to divide this stuff. Oh, I've got a one over seconds down in the denominator here, so that's gonna cancel that right there, and then this is kilogram meters, so that cancels that, and this cancels that, and I get units of distance. Oh, thank goodness, what a bother. All right, so then I get six, 0.67, six, sorry, six, three times 10 to the negative 34th, and I'm planning to divide that by 231. And this is the wavelength of Anton when he is barreling at you, and it is 2.87 times 10 to the negative 36 meters. Problem is, size of an atom is an angstrom, and that's something like 10 to the negative, well, an angstrom is 10 to the negative 10th meters. And this is 10 to the 26th times smaller than the size of an atom. So you can't measure the fact that Anton is wiggling. Oh, but he is wiggling. It's just a very, very subtle wiggle. 
his wavelength is really, really, really small. But let's take a typical electron. Let's say that electron has been accelerated through a 10 volt potential. If the electron has been accelerated through a 10 volt potential, then it has kinetic energy 10 electron volts. And if the electron has a potential energy, or uh, sorry, kinetic energy of 10 electron volts, then we can use the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, which is p squared over 2m to get, what do you want to get? Let's try to get the momentum of the electron. And the momentum of the electron is blah, 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 blah. But my plan is to find the wavelength of the electron, which is h divided by that momentum. You should do this stuff. You're going to have to convert into joules. Let's see, if this is 10 electron volts, that's probably going to be 1.6 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. And then you'll do all this stuff to convert to the momentum, and then you'll divide that by h. And then, oh, ding, we get. 3.88 times 10 to the negative 10th meters, which is 3.88, well, 3.88 angstroms. Wait a second, we said that the size of an atom was an angstrom. If this electron that's moving this fast has a wavelength of four angstroms, then we don't really know where it is. Oh, shoot. Okay, well, that's kind of weird. One final result of the, wait a second. Are you actually saying that electrons are wiggling? Does that mean that electrons are waves and they can interact with each other as if they were waves? Yeah, quantum's getting really nasty at this point. I'm gonna point out that we've got a fantastic application of this. What if you've got something like, uh, let's say there's a fancy crystal here. Do, do, do. It's like you're playing Legend of Zelda or something. And you're going to have, instead of having um, uh, <laughs> waves of light coming through this slit here and interacting with each other through this crystal, I'm going to say that we can have electrons going this direction. And the cool thing is, when the electrons hit the crystal, here they are, here's some here, right here, some of them interact with others of them, and you get this beautiful pattern here where these dots form on your screen. We've got, well, we've got constructive interference and destructive interference up on the screen here, so we must have had the electrons interacting with each other at the same time as if they were actually waves diffracting. This is called electron diffraction and it is used in electron microscopes. Electron microscopes use this effect all the time. I guess all we need here is for 2d times the sine of theta to be m times the wavelength of the electrons. Wow, these two guys, Davison and Germer, I don't remember if it was Davidson or Davison and Germer, they said, oh no, sorry, I need uh, M to be some natural number here. Um, Davison and Germer did an experiment where they were able to send electrons through a crystal. Now the important thing is, you don't want to think that the electrons are bouncing off the facets of this crystal. They are actually interacting with the crystal structure. So let me draw you a little sketch of what the crystal structure looks like. I'm going to turn it like this and draw my sketch as if the light is, well, the light, huh, the electrons are coming in here and I've got a crystal and it's something like this and there's atom, 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 atom. This is a very boring crystal. And then I'm going to have electrons coming in. Let's say the, the electrons are brown and they look like this. They're like one possibly bounces off right here and another one near it bounces off right here. Pew! And the difference in path length between these guys has something to do with theta. It has everything to do with theta. And it has something to do with the spacing right here, which I'm going to call the spacing d. So I write down my equation again. I get 2 times d times the sine of the angle theta is m times lambda. This is exactly the diffraction pattern that we had with light as well. However, the beautiful thing about electron diffraction The beautiful thing about electron diffraction is that the electron's wavelengths can be very, very small. Since the electron's wavelengths can be incredibly small, 
we can see with a much greater resolution. We can look at tiny, tiny, tiny things. And the electron microscope is one of the best microscopes possible to build in the world today. So Davison and Germer were able to actually measure, oh gosh, it is uh, Davison. Let's put those guys' names down here. Davison and Germer, they were actually able to measure the wavelength of electrons. So whether you like the idea of de Broglie or not, where he just comes in and says, hey, if light can be like a particle, then a particle can be like light in a wave-like manner. Whether you like that or not, these guys came around in 1928 and said, he's totally right. He won the Nobel Prize for work that he did as a graduate student. So get to work, graduate students. Change the world.